Good morning. Thank you for joining us online. We're so glad that you have decided to uh, spend these this next hour or so with us. I just want to uh, make sure that you realize and know that uh, we're going to be taking time this morning to participate in communion a little later on. And so if you haven't got your juice and your wafer or whatever it is, bread that you're using for communion, uh, you can take these next few moments to do that. And uh, we'll be doing that uh, here in a few moments after we sing a couple of songs. I want to share a call to worship. And I just want to give it a, a bit of a, uh, I guess, a uh, share a little bit of the backstory of what's happening and going on here in Second Chronicles. Before I read the text, the, the Ark of the Covenant had been gone. Uh, for many, many years, and, and finally it is being returned uh, to the temple. And as the uh, Israelites are in expectation of this amazing event, I want, us, I want me, uh, you to listen as I read uh, the account of what takes place there. And here's what we read in Second Chronicles chapter 5, and it says, And the Levites, who were musicians, the musicians always led the way in these types of things, Asaph, Heman, Judthun and all their sons' brothers were dressed in fine linen robes and stood at the east side of the altar playing cymbals, lyres, and harps. They were joined by 120 priests who were playing trumpets. So I want us to get this picture now. So you have all of these people. We don't know how many of they were, but we now we have 120 priests that have joined in with trumpets, the trumpeteers. And singers perform together in unison to praise and to give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raise their voices and praise the Lord with these words. He is good. His faithful love endures forever. I want to read that to you again. It's not repeated in scripture, but I want to read it to us again. He is good. His faithful love endures forever. At that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud. In the Old Testament, the cloud was a symbol of God's presence, and it was so heavy that they couldn't continue. For the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. My prayer and my hope for all of us today is that as we participate and as we encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit, that his presence would be so thick that it might even stop you from doing the, the things that maybe are good things. These were good things that God's people were doing. But the presence of God was so powerful and strong, it stopped them in their tracks as a reminder of how great God is. God is good. He is good. And his faithful love endures forever. I want that to be kind of the theme of our day today. As we open up God's word a little later on, as we participate in communion, as we sing some of these songs of praise and worship, that he is good and his faithful love will endure forever. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I thank you for the fact that, that just because this happened thousands of years ago in the Old Testament, before Jesus came to earth, Father, Lord, that the power of your spirit was so strong there that it stopped your people in their tracks. God, may you stop us in your tracks because of how powerful your presence is. God, I, uh, we ask and we invite you to, to use uh, whatever words need to be used, Father, whatever song that is sung, to use all of those things, God, to remind us of the power of your Holy Spirit. You are a good God. We are reminded again, you are good and your faithfulness endures forever. And so, Father, for whatever we do today, we want to bring glory and honor to your name. And so, God, I pray for each person that is watching, each home that is represented, Father, and we lift them up to you, God, and we just pray that as we worship together this morning, that you would be pleased, not because we do it in an amazing way, but because we've given our very best for the one that has given us all of these gifts. And for these things we ask, we ask in your name. Amen. God bless you this morning as you sing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our worship time off with Just As I Am. Thank you. 
Create in me a clean heart. to uh, remember why it is that we're able to have that a reality in our lives, that God would create in us a clean heart. I looked up the word communion earlier today, and there's a couple of different definitions, but I love the one definition that was there. It says sharing or ex exchanging intimate thoughts and feelings, especially mental, on a mental or spiritual level level. And I thought, you know what, as we use that word communion in our vocabulary, that's exactly what it is God wants us to do during these times. Why do we take part in communion? We do it for a number of different reasons. We do it to remember that Jesus Christ died for the sin of humankind and so that we could be forgiven from our sins and make heaven our home one day. We do it to proclaim his death as the reason why we're able to experience those things. We do it to give thanks, to say thank you, God, for sending your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to a cross for me. But we do it to examine our hearts, to ask him if there'd be something in our lives that, that isn't in alignment with him. We do it to commune with God. We do it to build that relationship that we have with him. We do it to announce and to acknowledge our covenant with him and we do it to anticipate his return that we know that one day Jesus will return to call us home and one day we'll spend eternity with him if we've committed our lives to follow him and so this is what the writer in first Corinthians says Paul writing to the church in Corinth he says I pass on to you I'm reading from first Corinthians chapter 11 I pass on to you what I received from the Lord myself. On the night when uh, he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. He broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. 
an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink of it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And so you are invited as we pause and as we examine ourselves, we're gonna, I'm going to take a moment in, in quiet prayer. We've got some music that's going to be played. And I would just ask that you would prayerfully examine your hearts and use this as a time to commune with God, to commune with the Holy Spirit, and to ask Him. And to ask Him if, if there's something in your heart and in your life that isn't right. And so as the, as the musicians play and as we just quiet our hearts before Him, I'd ask if you'd just do that and then I'll lead us in prayer before we receive communion today. Father God, thank you for the privilege it is to remember the sacrifice that you paid for us. And Lord, as we take these moments to examine our hearts, Father, I pray that you would speak life and light into our lives. Father, that, that for the, those that might be discouraged, God, they would receive encouragement. For those that need healing, Father, that they would receive healing. God, for those that, that uh, need a reminder, Father, uh, maybe a a gentle encouragement, a nudge, a spurring on, Father, in an area of their life that they would receive that from you. So God, as we receive communion together today, let us be reminded of the incredible sacrifice that you paid for us and be grateful and thankful for that. And for this we ask, we ask in your name, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, as I read just a moment ago, he took the bread and he broke it, and it serves as a reminder of his body being broke for us. And so as we take of communion today, as we take of the bread, we are reminded of Christ's body that was broken for us so that we could receive the gift of eternal life as a reminder that, that he is our daily bread who we need to lean on and rely on in all times and in all places. And so let us take together and be thankful today.
juice serves as a reminder of the blood which was shed for our sins, to wash them away. And that's an amazing thought when we stop and think about that, that our brokenness and our hurt and our pain and our sinful past can be forgiven by the God of this universe so that we could be made right and be able to stand in his presence. Without that, we are not able to stand in his presence because he is so pure and so holy. But when we've been forgiven of our sins with the blood that was shed on that mountain on Calvary 2,000 years ago, we're able to do that. And we'll be able to do that face to face one day in heaven. As we take of this juice together, let us be reminded of the great sacrifice that was paid so that our sins could be forgiven. God, thank you that we have the opportunity to commune with you and to be able to experience the power of your Holy Spirit living in our lives. And God, I would be remiss if I did not take this moment that if there's somebody that is watching that has never experienced the joy and the freedom that that can bring when we give all of those things to you and we're forgiven from our sins, Father. God, may this be their hour, may this be their day, Father, that they would do that. So God, continue to speak to hearts and lives as we continue to worship you this morning. And these things we ask, we ask in your name. Amen.
day that will be when we all get to heaven.
trust that you enjoyed uh, the first part of the service this morning and being able to take part in communion. Glad that we're able to do that. I know for those of you that have never done that uh, online or virtually before, it, uh, it seems a little strange uh, to be doing that. Maybe you're all by yourself, which probably seems a little bit stranger, but uh, we're doing this together. We are, uh, we are in this together and the Holy Spirit is here with us. We're beginning a new series uh, today and uh, it's going to continue for the next three or four weeks entitled True Virtue, True Virtue. And I want to talk about some things uh, to help us um, uh, think about how, how we become more Christ-like in our attitudes and interactions and how we treat and respond to so much that is happening and going on in our culture today. You know, some say, I, I, I learned this phrase just in the last probably three or four months, some say we're living uh, in the age of perpetual offense. Perpetual offense. What do I mean by that? What did the, whoever created that mean by that? That we're quick to judge, quick to criticize, quick to condemn. Uh, say quick with those words a, a lot of times together and you get tongue twisted. And quick to cancel uh, if anyone does offend. Uh, whether it be a politician, whether it be an athlete, uh, whether it be a business leader or celebrity or spiritual leader or your kid's school teacher, a uh, person that you work with, the, the, the list is endless, that as soon as they say something that we, we push back against or we disagree with, uh, we tend to want to rule out everything that they've ever said or done. It doesn't, it doesn't take much, it seems. Just a single misstatement or something that has transpired maybe years and years and years in the past but reappears um, uh, on, on, by video or by picture can cause us to question that. Maybe it's a friend who voted differently than what you voted or voted differently than what you thought they would vote. Uh, somebody you follow that you uh, disagree with on one single issue and then you have a tendency just to throw everything out. It seems kind of petty, but it's the reality of the culture that we, we live in and some of these things and some of these ideas. And here's what I want us to see today. Uh, if, you're, if you're on a continuous search to be offended, you'll always find what you're looking for. If you're on a continuous search to be offended, you will always find what you're looking for. There's something out there always, all the time, to be offended by what someone said or what someone did. There's, there's, we just, it's just the way that we are in our culture and in our world right now. And there's this term that uh, started flowing, uh, floating around a few years ago that I want to talk about today. And that's why I've entitled my message, Honor in a Cancel Culture. And the term is cancel culture. That, that we're being taught by our culture, and we're not being taught this, we're not taught this in God's word, we'll see here in a moment, but we're being taught in our culture that if somebody says something or does something that I disagree with, I cancel everything that they've ever done. Good, bad, it doesn't matter. I cancel it all out. It, it doesn't matter. And I want to ask ourselves a question, how do we honor in this type of a culture, Romans chapter 12, verse 10, says this, honor one another above yourselves. Notice that Jesus doesn't, doesn't give a caveat to this teaching, and the writer of Romans doesn't give an exception to this teaching that we'll see in a moment, that we're to honor one another above ourselves. So how are we, how are we doing at honoring others above ourselves today? What a great question to ask, isn't it? Because in this world of dishonor and distrust and dis all kinds of different things, it's way easier, if you want the easiest way, and the easiest thing is to not honor. What do you do to combat this? In Mark chapter 6, Jesus tells a, uh, or sorry, Mark tells an interesting story about Jesus. Uh, and I just want to give you a bit of a context here. To what was happening and going on before I read this passage of scripture. The context is Jesus had just healed a woman. He had raised a girl from the dead. He was in his hometown. It wasn't his birthplace. Of course, we remember from the Christmas story that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but his hometown was Nazareth. This is the place that he grew up and people were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for Jesus who is now there and is now present. 
And so I want to read to you the, the text from Mark chapter 6 this morning, four verses. And so I just, I, you need that context, that Jesus had done some amazing things, had healed a woman, has, had raised a dead girl, that she was alive again. Those are amazing things. And here in verse 1 of chapter 6, we read, Jesus left that part of Nazareth where he had been, that part of the country, and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. So he's been away. He's been doing some amazing things, some miraculous things. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Obviously, you, you get to hear Jesus preach. I mean, the preacher of all preachers. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. Mark gives us an indication here. They're not really asking where he got all his wisdom and all his power to perform these miracles. It's almost like they're saying, who is this guy? That we know so well, we watched him grow up, we, we, we watched him uh, have disagreements with his, his, his family and his brothers and sisters and all those things that were part of life. We've watched him. Who does he think he is? Who, where did he get this power from? So Mark tells us, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. Again, like, who is this guy? Like, who does he think he is coming in here and portraying that yeah, he is the Messiah and all of those things? And then if you underline, I want you to see these next words. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Think about this just for a moment. That Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, comes into his hometown and begins to teach, begins to preach, has done all of these amazing things, healed the sick, raised, raised the dead. And they were deeply offended. I, I'm here to tell you that if people are offended by doing the things that God has called you to do, you're in good company because you're in the company of, of Jesus. And then Jesus told them in verse 4, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives in his own family in his hometown Jesus was without honor those that knew him best on a on a personal level dishonored him the most he was without honor Jesus says and Mark says here I want us to see what that term without honor means uh, there's a Greek word uh, that says atomus, which means to dishonor, to treat as common or ordinary. And this, in fact, is how Jesus was being treated. Jesus, the Son of God, I want us to understand this. That Jesus was being treated without honor. So what's, what's the opposite of dishonor? Well, of course, it's honor. And the Greek word is teme, which is spelt time in our English language, but teme is how it's pronounced in the Greek, and it means to value or respect or to highly esteem, to treat as precious, weighty, or valuable. And so what does honor do? Honor does all of those things, doesn't it? It esteems someone, it cherishes them, it values them, it builds them up, it believes the very best. And, and this is what the writer of Romans here tells us, compels us really, how we should be treating others. What does dishonor do? It treats as common, it tears down, it devalues, it actually assumes the worst. It questions the motives of what anybody is, is, is doing. And so sometimes it's really easy to honor certain people in cer certain circumstances when maybe we don't know them really well, but we only know one or two things about them. And so we show them all kinds of honor, but then we find out something about them. And it's like, who are they? Who do they think they are to tell me what to do? And so we begin bad mouthing them. I want us to see just for a moment, just for the sake of def definition, that we make a great mistake when we don't honor those that, that God has called us to honor. 
because the world is watching and our culture is watching to see how we respond, especially in these uncertain days of this cancel culture. There's a difference between honor and respect, and I want us to see this before we get into it, that, that you say, well, I don't know how I can honor them, I don't respect them. And I don't know who said this originally, but it's true, respect is earned, but honor is given. Respect is something that an individual has to earn. I have to earn your respect. We can't respect somebody immediately if we don't know them very well. But over the course of time, an individual can earn somebody's respect. But honor is something that is given. We give somebody honor because of our responsibility. And it's the thing that God has called us to do. In our text, when, when the people of Nazareth saw Jesus, they scoffed. Have you ever scoffed when you saw someone before? looked at them and said, who do they think they are? I remember when they were, and we fill in the blanks. And even though that's so far in the past, maybe, or maybe not so far in the past, but perhaps it's something that's been forgiven. It's, maybe they've t turned their life around, but maybe they haven't turned their life around. But we hold them to that through their past action, and yet that's the same thing that Jesus went through. They, they said things maybe that, that we don't have in our text. He was just a carpenter. He was nothing special. He's nothing special. He's just ordinary. He's that annoying kid that the teachers loved. Knew all the answers. Can you imagine being in a, in a class with Jesus? He'd know all the answers, right? And so he knew what it was like to experience that. And so they were offended. It's not much different than today, is it? We're so easily offended when somebody is able to do something that maybe we can't do. We're looking for reasons to offend. So who are we called to honor today? I want to touch on, on four of these really, really quick because I think they're so important for us to be reminded of in our present day and present time. First of all, we're called to honor God. We're called to honor God. Where do we see this? Well, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, we see that, that we're called to do this. And the text will be here in front of you in just a moment. We're called to honor God with our wealth and with our first fruits. And, and Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And so we're called to honor God. We're called to honor God regardless of our situations and our circumstances. And, and, and for the most part, we get that, don't we? We understand that we need to do that. And over the course of time, we think, what are we going to do? How are we going to figure that out? And so when we stop and think about honoring God and what it looks like, we honor God with our wealth, our first fruits, our body, and our worship. Secondly, we honor our parents. God calls us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, to honor our parents. And so how do we do that? And I, and I know some of you are, are thinking, you know what, my parents have done this and my parents have done that and I don't respect them and I don't know what kind of a home that you grew up in, but maybe you grew up in a home that that's difficult to do. But Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 makes it really, really clear that we're to honor the parents that God has given to us. And we can do that, can't we? We can honor them. I think about it in, in, in this way, that you can honor them for giving you life, for allowing you to experience whatever it is that, that you're experiencing. Here's where I want to spend a little extra time today is in uh, the third one, is honoring those in authority. Honoring those in authority that God has put over us. I want to read this passage of scripture from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. It's kind of lengthy, but I want to read the, the entire thing there because I think of, of all scriptures right now, probably this one is the most pertinent with everything that is happening and going on. It says this, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. I want to just stop there for a moment. Any authority, authority that exists in this world right now is there because God has allowed it to happen. Good, bad, or indifferent. We can have discussions about that authority and about maybe some of the things that they are doing and not doing and all of those things. But the fact remains 
that God has allowed them there. Let's keep reading as we uh, continue. In, uh, there we go. The authorities that exist have been established by God. They're there by God's plan. In verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the ones in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities. Not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servant, who gave their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe, what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then then honor. Over the years, some leaders are always liked more than others. We can disagree and agree with leaders, but we can do it in an honorable way. There's been people in my own life, some that have been in leadership over me, that I have disagreed with maybe decisions that they've made or the way that they wanted them done. And I hope and I pray, and I know I always haven't gotten this right, but I always try to honor them in the position that they're in, regardless of whether I agree or disagree with them. And that's the culture. That's the culture that, that Jesus came to bring here on earth. That we would honor one another, honor those that have been put in authority over us. Because he knew this, and this is why this matters so much. He knew that if we can't, uh, honor the, those that have been in author, uh, put in authority over us in an earthly sense, we will never be able to honor God in a, in a heavenly sense. There's a direct connection, whether we like it or not, that we will respond and honor God in the same way that we honor those that he has put in authority over us. They're connected. They're not, they're not separated like sometimes we like to do. Number four, and I struggled with whether or not I was going to put this one in because this, this points the finger back on me a little bit. But I want to touch on this just for a moment. That God calls us to honor our pastors and our spiritual leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, I want, see, I want us to see these words. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, Timothy says, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Why, why is the, the writer here so intent on, on making sure that we know that this group of people ought to be honored? Because he knew, I believe, that there could be a tendency to dishonor pastors and spiritual leaders. And I've discovered this about people over the last little while. As I've scrolled through social media feeds and those types of things, you know who the worst, and I can say this because I'm one of them, do you know who the worst people are at showing honor to other pastors and spiritual leaders? Other pastors and spiritual leaders. And so if you're watching today, and if, if you happen to be a pastor, if you happen to be a spiritual leader, I believe that we have... Uh, even a, a bigger responsibility to show honor to those other pastors and spiritual leaders that we're surrounded with. It, it honestly breaks my heart when I see people posting things on, on Facebook that are spiritual leaders and, and are pastors. I hold them, yes, to probably a different standard, a higher standard. When they're highly critical 
of, of, of what other pastors might be saying or doing. And there's a place for disagreement. Hear my heart here. There is a place to uh, pick up the phone or maybe to send an email depending on your relationship with the pastor that you might be disagreeing with, but not to bash them personally on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram and on TikTok and, and on whatever other social media platform that you're using. And I believe that it's, it's more important now than ever to get this right because the world and the culture is watching. Our words have weight. And we have a responsibility to do this, to show honor to those that God has put around us. Now, hear what I'm saying and, and don't hear what I'm not saying. It, it doesn't mean that we agree. Honor does not mean we agree with every single thing that they do. But it simply means that we honor them for the person that God has created and for the position that has been put there that God has allowed to be present. So why does honor matter so much? Why does honor matter? It's not just right, but dishonor will hurt you. Dishonor will corrupt who you are and who God wants you to become. And there's something within us that humbles our heart and our spirit when we show honor to the people around us that God has, that, that God has put around us. If we were to continue reading, I'm not sure if I have the text there uh, up on the screen or not, but in, if we were to continue reading in Mark chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, it is there, good. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his relatives in his, in his home country. But well, we read that just a, a moment ago, or even in his own home. I want us to see verse 5 though, because this ought to have been like telling of, of what was going on. You read what it says, he could not do any miracles there, except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. Because of their dishonor, Mark tells us that Jesus couldn't do many miracles there. Now, I like how he does this. He says, except lay hands on a few people and heal them. And I looked at this passage of scripture this week and I said, well, those are pretty miraculous things to do. But I think what Mark was driving at here is there probably could have been other miracles that people could have been healed physically, some sick people that were there. But I wonder if Mark is, is trying to get at the root of the matter here that the most important healing that can take place is life transformation when we surrender our lives to Jesus. And because of the dishonor in the culture and in that community towards Jesus, we're told that he did not do any miracles there, or many miracles, some of your translations might say. Because of this. You see, Jesus only goes where he is respected and honored. He will respect your decision to dishonor him and move on. And God has called us to honor these people in our hearts and lives. And so I asked myself the question as I was preparing for this, are there some things that God has not done in my life and in my circumstances because of dishonor towards him, rather directly towards him or indirectly towards others, but really is a direct, directly towards him because he's put, put those people in my life. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, honor one another above yourselves. I like how another translation puts it. And it says this, outdo one another in showing honor. Imagine if we lived in a culture and in our world that we were competing with one another to show other people honor. And I know it's tough and I know it's hard. I've been in those circumstances and those situations before where everybody that is like-minded, it just seems to be piling on somebody else that most times isn't present to defend themselves. But maybe somebody that's an authority figure. And I don't mean that you have to do the, 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 uh, you know, the overly, like, look at me, I'm spiritual, I'm just going to pray for that person. But I think there's a way that we can interject into those conversations to show some honor to those folks, to honor our parents, to honor those in authority over us, to honor God, to honor the spiritual leaders that God has put over us. Mark chapter 15, verse 8, last scripture I'll share with you. 
before I'm done. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What, what is Jesus saying there? They, they're honoring me. They're giving me lip service, but they're not truly honoring me. Yeah, they're saying they're honoring God. They're going to church. They're raising their hands. They're going through the motions, doing all the right things, but their hearts are not truly honoring me because of how they're showing, not showing honor towards others. I want to read this story and then I'm done. Babe Ruth, considered the greatest home run hitter of all time in Major League Baseball. The Bambino autographed tons of baseballs. I mean, there's all kinds of baseballs in circulation, even still today, with his signature on them. Uh, interesting enough, I was reading an article this week about Babe Ruth and how he used to love to come and, and has, had visited, has visited Nova Scotia a few times and would come here for a reprieve, which I thought was kind of interesting uh, that we have that in this part of the world, uh, a claim to fame of sorts. Uh, but despite all of that, he only ever autographed seven, seven home run bats. There was only seven of his bats. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is bats cost a lot of money. And back then, baseball players didn't make a ton of money. And so he wouldn't want to autograph them and give them away because he would want them. So there's only seven of them that he ever autographed. One of those seven bats vanished for decades. Nobody knew where it was. They knew where the other six were, but didn't know where the seventh was. It resurfaced just a few years ago in 2006. And it was a bat used, used to hit home run 1,923 and was given away as a home run contest prize. Can you imagine winning a home run contest in some little league park and you get Babe Ruth's autographed bat? That's how it had been won. In 1988, the story is told that a man sick in his deathbed, no living relatives, offered his prized bat that he had won years before in a home run contest, contest that was signed by Babe Ruth, that was offered this prized bat to uh, Marcia, or Marcia, I'm not sure how she uh, pronounced her name, who was a nurse who had served and honored him for many, many years as his personal assistant. For the next 18 years, she kept the bat under her bed. He passed away. She keeps the bat and just puts it under her bed. Retired from nursing, she dreamed of opening a restaurant but never had enough money to be able to do it. She thought of that bat and she thought, well, maybe it's worth something. She had no idea uh, how much it might be worth, didn't really know who Babe Ruth was, kind of knew that he was uh, maybe kind of an important sports figure in history. And she goes in in 2006 to a sports memorabilia shop with this bat that's been signed by Babe Ruth. The owner is shocked. Can you imagine being the owner of that store? He verifies, because he thinks she's crazy, it can't really be his. He verifies the missing Babe Ruth bat. And in 2006, she auctioned off the bat for almost $1.3 million dollars. Incredible, isn't it? Just this bat that would have been worth just a few dollars when Babe Ruth, before he used it. And she used a portion to start a restaurant. And here's what I want us to hear here today. She used a portion to start the restaurant and then donated the rest to a foundation for children that was close to Babe Ruth's heart. And I want you to see what she wrote in, in connection to this baseball bat. She said this, she said the bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. Since he made it valuable, the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. Isn't it incredible that this lady that has, had shown this man so much honor receives this great gift says, this bat is only worth something because of what somebody else did with it. I need to honor him. And honor him by opening a restaurant and then giving most of it away to a charity. What does it look like if we're a follower of Christ to honor someone that is far more valuable than a baseball bat signed by Babe Ruth? Whoever it is that we're struggling to honor today is somebody that has been created in the image of God 
and is in a position of authority that God has allowed to happen, how much more important is it as a follower of Jesus to honor them? You see, our only reasonable response is to honor one another above ourselves, to give like we've never given before. It may not be monetary things. It may be to give our time, but to say, I'm going to honor you because that's what God has called us to do. And I, and I can tell you this, in a culture and in a time where dishonor is running rampant, there is nothing that you will be more noticed for in a good way and to be salt and light in our culture and in our world by showing honor to folks and to people and to positions, especially when you disagree with them. Remember I said, it's okay to disagree with somebody, but we don't get to dishonor them because we disagree with their politics or we disagree with whatever. I know I'm meddling now. But the heart of the gospel is centered on this honor theme. So what is it that I need to do differently today? What is it that you need to do differently today to show honor to those that are in your life that God has allowed to be there? Let me pray with you. Father God, thank you for your goodness to us. Father, thank you for the fact that, that uh, you've allowed us the, the privilege and the honor to be able to to serve you, but Father, with that comes the responsibility, Father, to honor others that you've put in our hearts and lives. And sometimes that's really easy to do, but then, Father, there's other times that that's really hard to do. And so, God, God I pray that for, for whatever is said and done, that we would show the honor that is due you to others that you have put into our lives. And God, that is the thing that would mark us as followers of Jesus and mark us as a church. God, we love you today. Thank you for the privilege it is for being able to serve you and to honor you in this way by honoring others. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you will join us next Sunday as we continue in our series uh, about uh, uh, true virtue. And we're going to be talking about a matter of integrity next week. And if you're a type that likes to read ahead, uh, we're going to be spending a little bit of time in Psalms. God bless you. Hope you have a great day. And I uh, hope you have a great week on account of God's presence being with you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.